Welcome to another edition of How Worcester Works. This episode we're going to be exploring and learning about Worcester's Hope Cemetery, our city-owned cemetery. Joining me today is the Assistant Commissioner of Public Works for Parks and Cemeteries, uh, Rod Antonelli. So, Rod, tell us a little bit about the, how many acres the cemetery is, how many folks are buried here, and where in Worcester uh, Hope Cemetery actually sits. So Hope Cemetery is situated on Hope Ave in Webster Street. Our main entrance is on Webster Street. And uh, we have 160 acres. Uh, we currently have eight employees, full-time employees. Uh, two office staff and six uh, maintenance staff uh, that are year-round. Uh, we supplement that every spring and through the fall. During the heat of the summer when we're cutting grass on a daily basis, we upgrade to about 10 to 12. And then we sort of fall back down as fall rolls around. So in total, uh, we're in the range of somewhere between 18 and 20, um, and they're spread out based on the needs of the cemetery and the time frame on that. Of that 160 acres, uh, we mow all of it, uh, with the exception of, of where the gravestones are. And that process is approximately about a three week um, to four week cycle, uh, depending on weather, depending on all of the other factors that are out there that we may need to accomplish. Um, and that's with, our, with the full complement of both temporary help and full-time help. Now, Hope Cemetery is what they call a garden cemetery, uh, similar to rural cemetery here in Worcester, which is a private uh, cemetery. Some people might know Mount Auburn Cemetery in Boston or Cambridge. Um, tell us what a, a garden cemetery is as compared to maybe a, a typical cemetery people are familiar with. So a, a garden cemetery really is about plants, about um, vegetation, about a place for people to be able to come and relax. It's more of a, of a park kind of setting than it is uh, just a straight cemetery where uh, they don't allow plantings in and around stones. They don't allow uh, those kinds of interactions and more of that natural beautification uh, of the park. So the cemetery here um, is filled with trees, beautiful, uh, fully grown trees all across the cemetery, different species of trees which really does give it kind of a park-like feel to it. Yeah, and what we do is we, on a, on a regular yearly basis, as part of an Arbor Day celebration, uh, we work with the Friends of Hope Cemetery and Gates Lane School, and we, we plant a minimum of two trees every year as part of that, pr part of that process. Um, so we're always adding trees. Um, th the battle really comes in of trying to manage both the internment of someone's loved ones and, the, and having a tree nearby or, or, have, or planting a tree. So we're always balancing those two items. Um, you know, we'd love to have more trees, but sometimes just because of the way lots are set up or where our monuments are, it becomes a little difficult to be able to do that because we don't want to impact um, a family's loved one that has been, you know, that we have uh, placed in Hope Cemetery. Now, of course, when you have that many trees, uh, fall comes in New England. So tell me a little bit about what it takes to get all of those leaves kind of picked up and cleaned up and heading into the winter months. So not only do we battle the whole cutting of grass every year um, from April through September, but as we get into uh, October, now we have a leaf. We have a lot of leaves coming down, a lot of huge oak trees that choose to keep their leaves on for extended periods of time that make our job a little bit more difficult. Um, but we have a, uh, a bunch of supplies and equipment that we bring out. Uh, one of our largest pieces of equipment is a, is a vacuum that our staff take and blow all of the leaves to the roadway. And this machine is pulled behind uh, a dump truck and it picks up all of those leaves, grinds them up, picks all of that up, and then it's used as a compost or uh, we use it as part of that process. That is a never-ending battle as we go through. Um, we are still, as of um, in May, we're still picking up some leaves because you never get to everything. And then we mulch. We do, we still, we're still mowing in September, October, and even into November. And so we're mulching that at the same time. So now where the benefit is, is that we're putting that mulch back into the grass to be allow that to fertilize what's there and to help that as we go into the winter months so that when spring comes along, We've done that as well. So it's, it's a never-ending cycle of maintenance, but 
it's, you know, it's important to, for us to continue to be able to do that and to be able to uh, make this cemetery uh, you know, really shine. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important obligation that the city has. Uh, people have made arrangements over the years to be buried here or to have a loved one buried here. And it's our kind of responsibility as a city to make sure that we keep the cemetery looking, um, you know, like the community cares uh, and that and their loved ones are respected. And that's what we do. And, and you'll see, even in the middle of winter, we were still here. We were plowing, uh, making sure that the cemetery was accessible. Uh, making sure that we could still do burials. Uh, we do burials year-round. For us, it's, a, it's that never-ending cycle with snow removal, with grass, with leaves. Um, but you know what? That's what we're here for. We're here to be able to give the residents of Worcester a quality product. And you know, that's what we continue to shoot for. We continue to make changes to make things better. Mm -hmm. And we're, you know, we're continually excited to do some new and different things as well. Now, of course, Worcester is a city that has had many immigrant groups over its history come, various waves of immigration. Um, and if you look at the cemetery, it kind of reflects that diversity and those, uh, whether it be different religious groups or different ethnic groups that have made up Worcester's population uh, over the last couple hundred years. So maybe you just talk a little bit about the different ethnic or religious sections of uh, the cemetery. Yeah, so we have a number of those. Um, we have a number of specific religious groups that have areas that they have been placed in or particular uh, burials from the Mechanic Street burial or the Civil War burial ground that are specific to a certain group. We also have just general public uh, coming in, purchasing a lot, and being placed next to somebody that they don't even know who that is or from a different religion. And, and that's the one thing about this that is you know is great about Hope Cemetery is that we have we go across the entire gamut of religion of race of everything um, and for us we have a couple of major ones we have a Greek Orthodox section uh, just off of Hope Ave uh, which is uh, very highly used uh, we've actually at this point uh, continuing to work with them to find more space for for those families and those loved ones uh, we have a Jewish section as well uh, that's out in the back where it's a completely different design than our Greek Orthodox section or in other areas. Um, and so we try to work with all of our uh, religious groups to, to find ways to be able to uh, address the, their needs mm -hmm. while still meeting the goals of the cemetery, which is to be open for, everybody's, for everyone's use um, and still keeping that garden feel to it. Now, we're in a room that's used as a chapel. Uh, so sometimes if uh, a family wanted to have some kind of service, uh, this is an option available to them uh, prior to the burial that they could uh, have access to this space and have either uh, a religious service or even a non-religious service in this space. Maybe just talk about how do people access this? Is there a cost associated with it? Uh, as you mentioned previously, it is open f uh, 12 months of the year, so no matter the dead of winter or uh, any of the other seasons, uh, we're open for business. So yeah, so this building, uh, we built this chapel as part of our, our new administration building back in the early 2000s. And uh, this chapel slash meeting space slash um, event space uh, is really a good option for uh, those wet days, uh, those um, snowy days where families don't want to have to truck all the way out to a gravesite or, or, there's, or they choose to do something more inside. Uh, the facility is available for any burial at any time um, and they would just go through our main office for that. Uh, there is a cost for that, it's no different, the cost for that is no different than what we charge for a tent on, you know, at a gravesite. And, what happens is, is it really gives people a little bit of space to be able to sit down and, and, and have any kind of uh, opportunity to you know, respect the loved one that has passed away. And we allow the families to make that decision. Uh, we send out to all of our funeral homes on a yearly basis a reminder that this facility is available that we are more than happy to have it available for them. Yeah, it's a nice additional amenity that uh, is offered here at Hope Cemetery that you know, if there's inclement weather or you have family members who might be in wheelchairs or infirmed who aren't comfortable going out into the cemetery in the 
inclement weather, you could do a service here. Right, so Rob, we're in the office at Hope Cemetery. How many folks a year are buried on average? So we average about uh, a little about 110, 115 lots that we sell per year. And then we average somewhere in the range of 250 to 270 on our burials. Um, that's been the case over the last uh, three or four years. Um, and we, we keep track of that on a regular basis. So some folks uh, have a death in the family and they need to buy a lot. Um, or some folks pre-plan and decide yep. that they want to purchase a lot for themselves or their family. Uh, and so you're selling both kinds of... of yeah, we'll, we'll sell lots at any point in time to you know, anybody as they come in, whether it's uh, because someone has unexpectedly passed away or are planning for that in the future to help their family out. Uh, we do both. We do two grave, single grave. Um, we do assisted burials as well. Uh, we do four grave lots. And they vary. They vary all over the cemetery depending on where they want to be and, and what we have available. Uh, we don't have a lot of the larger lots anymore. Um, we find that we don't really sell a lot of those anyway. Um, so we've really started downsizing on that side on the numbers that we have available. We're continually adding, looking for new space. Uh, we have a whole area that used to be the compost area that we'll be looking to move into uh, relatively soon um, as part of a plan uh, that we're going to try to work on uh, over the next uh, year or so to look at expansion of the cemetery so that we continually have the availability of space for for people to be able to bury in some in hope. So how much is a single grave, a double grave? Just give folks a sense of what the price range is. We address these every year um, in and around October, November. They go into effect as of July, uh, January 1 of every year. And so at this point, our single grave is $900 um, for a flat marker. So a family has a choice. You know, you can do a flat marker, you can do a monument, um, and then there's certain restrictions on those based on how close everything is together and how big you can do that. But so a monument grave is $1,200 because there are a little bit slightly larger lots, and two graves for a flat marker are $1,800, and two graves for a monument is $2,000 and then it moves down from there. So our largest lot that we have available, a 10 grave uh, with a monument is about uh, 7,300 bucks on that end of it. Now do folks have to pay all at once? Do you have a payment plan? We do allow payment plans, um, but at, we need them to follow the rules of, of, of being able to uh, be placed there. So uh, we will allow someone to go through that process, but if it's a single grave, then we need it paid up front to be able to be buried. Um, if it's uh, two graves, then we allow a little bit more time uh, for that if they came in because one has one just passed away. Most people end up going on um, some sort of, some people go on a payment schedule. Some of them, since we've instituted the credit card uh, acceptance, will pay it all up front. So if somebody is pre-planning, um, they're able to do a payment plan uh, if they want to buy a two or four grave right. lot. Um, now the stones obviously is something that's done separately. We don't sell the stones themselves. Um, and the, the uh, concrete containers that the caskets go in, is that something that the cemetery sells? So we supply those as part of our opening and closing of a burial. Uh, we supply that to the families. Uh, it's really based on the, on the funeral home and what their needs are and what the family's needs are. Um, when it comes to the monuments, the monuments are all done by some of our uh, local monument dealers. Uh, we do the foundations for those. Uh, so there's a process for, you know, the monument companies contact us and we say, okay, this is the size you can have. We'll put in the, the monument foundation for that. And then they come in and set the monument and put the monument up. They do all the engraving, uh, all of that. But once, the, once we start digging the hole between digging and putting the liner in and bringing it back up, that is all Hope Cemetery. We do all of that as well as the foundation for the monument. And so when somebody purchases the grave, are they purchasing not only the land, 
but they're purchasing. Are they purchasing the opening and closing, or is that an additional fee? That's an additional fee um, at the time of burial. So that will all be part of that process. Uh, we have not, at least at this point, gone into um, sort of that full pre-planning component, uh, but uh, we've looked at that as a possibility, but we, have, we haven't gone that far as yet. Yeah. Now, obviously a lot more people <clears throat> these days are choosing cremation. Uh, as opposed to uh, burial. Um, can we accommodate that? Uh, we, we don't have a crematorium here, but in terms of ashes um, or urns, how is that accommodated? So on, for us, uh, for every lot that we sell, so if it's a single grave lot, you can, we, we're, we allow a full burial and then two cremations on top of the full burial. So for a two grave lot, you get two full burials and then four cremations on top. Um, or you can just buy a single lot and do a cremation on there. One of the things that we're working on now is a columbarium. So a columbarium is like a um, some structure where you're able to uh, have a, a box that you're able to put uh, your loved ones in and they would, they would be above ground so they wouldn't be in the ground. So we're working on doing a columbarium. Uh, some of the other cemeteries uh, in and around Hope have those as well as some of the ones in the local area have those. So we're moving down that road. Right now all we do for cremations are, bur are, are burials for those. Um, and the pricing is very different. It's a lot less uh, work for us on the, on the cremation side than it is on a full burial. And so you kind of alluded to the fact you're looking at the, the column burials, you're looking at expanding the Greek Orthodox section. So in this year's budget we've indicated we're putting aside $100,000 to do a master plan for Hope Cemetery so that it would allow you to figure out where we need to make the investments going forward, whether they be kind of answering some of these questions or other needs that the cemetery has. Maybe just talk a little bit about what we're hoping to accomplish with that process. Sure, so what we're trying to do is really uh, gather up with public input um, a plan uh, for the future on where we're going to do. It's going to be really the guidebook that's going to tell us okay, this is what we're going to do, this is where we're going to go, uh, these are the priorities. Um, the Hope Cemetery Commission has really been clear in, in some of those areas of what uh, they want to see and, and what we want to see as a, as a city. Um, but the feeling really is, is, okay, we need to get out there and get some more public input on that. So we envision, uh, I envision that we're going to be doing this no differently than we'll do a master plan for a public park or a master plan for a particular neighborhood or a district that we that the city has always done and we'll reach out to the public have them come in talk about what's a priority for them and and, and be able to take all of that information put it into a document and then use that document for future um, for future improvements to the facility whether that's additional water spigots um, for around this around the cemetery on the new water system that we're that we're working with the friends of hope cemetery on this year um, or whether it's doing more work on the genealogy side uh, where we're to make the genealogy piece much easier for people to to gather that information be able to obtain that information um, so those are the things that that will help us sort of steer us in the direction we want to do because we're not able to do everything all at once um, so we need to be able to prioritize those and find out what's the most important things and then let's start moving on and bring our partners in the Greek Orthodox um, and our other religious organizations in and, and the Friends of Hope Cemetery and everybody else and say, okay, what's important to everybody and then prioritize those. You know, you mentioned the genealogy and that there are a lot of people who are looking to find out what happened to their great-great-grandfather or where's their great-great-uncle uh, buried or they know that, um, you know, they served in the Civil War and they heard they might be in Hope Cemetery. So we get a lot of calls uh, or people dropping by trying to find uh, a distant relative to kind of put that family history together. Um, what, what are some of the assets that we have here that help people understand, you know, what happened to a loved yep. one uh, further back in their family tree? So for us, the biggest assets we have are the two office staff. I mean, they're the ones that are going, that are going to make that contact initially, be able to go into the system, whether it's the computer system or our card files over here, and really be able to um, help those individuals and find out, you know, uh, date of death, death certificate, all of that information, lot location, and that. 
Um, so those are the key components there. We're averaging somewhere in and around 20 or so requests per week. Wow. Um, and that's on top of all of the other work, uh, the accounting work and the processing of burials and, and the selling of lots and everything else that we're doing here with two office staff. So we're getting a lot there. So one of the major priorities for us is really to start that digitization of the documents we have. Because um, everything we have right now is all paper. Yep. And so we need to make sure that we protect those yeah. as well as uh, be able to make those easier for our office staff here as well as the, the general public to be able to gain access to that uh, for the future. Can we see some of those cards? Sure, we can. See what they look like. So Mr. Manager, a uh, couple of things. So our general logbook, these are older logbooks that um, list you can see the penmanship, the penmanship uh, it was just incredible. Tells you the interment number, uh, what it was, the date of the deceased. And so this is, this is what, we, what we would use um, in the past. And this would be one of the documents that we have. So you could see why it would be helpful to somebody who's trying to find out what happened to somebody, a uh, great, great grandparent or whatever. Because uh, you have their name, you have the date that they died. Uh, you have the date that they were interned, how old they were when they passed away, the location of their grave, yep. uh, the place that they died, yep. uh, as well as the name of the undertaker. So there's a lot of information that somebody who's trying to do some research could then use to find additional information right. about, oh, I didn't realize they died there, or what funeral home, or, um, you know, any of the other kind of pertinent information. What, one of the things with these is that it's difficult to be able to track this unless you have some of that pertinent information yeah. regarding date or uh, location and that whereas in a electronic format you'd be able to put in a, a name um, or a or a location or a date of death and be able to track that that way so one of the other ones here that I've that we've been able to pull out is uh, Robert Goddard so this is the card so we used to do uh, special care agreements with some certain lots. We, we've stopped that and we maintain all of our lots uh, very similar. So this is the actual um, uh, special care agreement uh, that Dr. Goddard's wife purchased yep. when he passed away. And he's probably one of the more famous people who are buried here, the father of modern rocketry. Uh, who went to school and was a professor at Clark at WPI. Um, and it's fascinating to see how much it cost uh, back in 1953 when it was purchased uh, and all the information. So you could definitely see how this would be valuable to a historian who's yep. looking up somebody of note um, who happens to be buried here or just a family member who's curious about uh, someone from their their past so and then on each of our cards uh, we what we show is the information that's necessary for us to be able to understand where someone is um, uh, where the monuments located whether there's a footstone or a headstone or if it's a full-size stone whether there's a government marker uh, for a veteran and so this information gives us you the date that the date that they passed the location so this would be left front two um, so you go center, left, right, and you count out one, two, three, four, depending on how many, how many you have. And it will tell you who's in each of those locations. And then these little boxes on the bottom talk about um, foot markers. So those would be the foot markers and those would be um, uh, head markers. And then we talk about who purchased it, uh, when they purchased it. We have all, some of this information on there, um, some more of the depth and then some informational pieces, endowment piece in 1953. So this is the card, this is the, this is the document that we use for all of the information. And that's the case for everybody that we, that we bury. Everybody that comes in is put on a card like this uh, and then we cross-reference it with other um, material either by name um, so that we can easily go back and forth whether it's by name or um, by lot section. So some people know that they're loved one was buried at a particular lot section but don't know the name and we're able to cross-reference those in that way. And this is kind of interesting because it's indicative of probably what a lot of families, you look at the first burial uh, was made in uh, 1906 and the last burial was made in 1996. Yep. So over a 90 year history, 
could be grandparents, parents, grandchildren buried in the same lot. Um, and this kind of tells a lot about the family history and, and you know, how uh, the different generations you know, were buried in this particular uh, spot. Yeah, and so our goal really is, is to get all of this onto um, a uh, electronic format. Not that we're going to go away from this, this process here either, because it's always good to have you know, multiple backups and archives. But for us, this, this will make it easier for our staff to be able to do research um, to allow the Historical Museum to do research yeah. on those here. Uh, this is really, um, for us, one of the main functions that we want to do to be able to preserve this, because without this information, uh, you know, we, we're lost without all of this stuff put down. Worcester's Hope Cemetery. Here's a beautiful uh, area, kind of quiet. You can hear the birds, you can see the beautiful um, stones, the beautiful trees, the kind of rolling green. Uh, as you mentioned, there's some areas where there's some hills and slopes there that really give it a nice kind of uh, contemplative atmosphere to walk around and kind of uh, experience the cemetery. Um, when you look at what the use you get um, beyond the sadness of someone losing a loved one, the, the use of people coming here and being able to reflect and being able to um, become more healthy uh, and to do those. And to think that we're doing this in the middle of a city of 180,000 people, you know, really for a lot of people will just say like, there's no way that that's happening. And we really have that availability uh, in Worcester to have that amenity for people um, and to be able to do it at a decent price and we're, you know, we're excited about the, you know, the continual involvement um, and the continual work on the history side, as well as our genealogy side, as well as our continued upgrading on the maintenance side. So, you know, we're doing a lot, and uh, we hope for us the the most important thing is is we're helping families be able to um, uh, still see their loved ones and be able to visit those loved ones um, at the same time supplying them with a very high quality product. Well, thank you, Rob, for sharing with us uh, all that goes into operating Hope Cemetery, and thank you to all the staff that work here, uh, the folks who work in the office, the folks who work out in the cemetery. They do a great job. A lot of times they're kind of behind the scenes, uh, but without them we wouldn't have such a, a great amenity here in the city and, and look, looking as good as it does, so thank you. Well, thank you, you very much. We're going to hear from uh, one of our former mayors uh, and a professor at the College of the Holy Cross, John Anderson, who's going to tell us a little bit about the history of Hope Cemetery, some of the folks buried here. Now see, this is fascinating. So this is Mrs. Goddard sent this note with a check for $3 in 1965 um, to add some geraniums to her husband's grave. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah.